Are you ready? Okay. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming. I'm Eric Rollinson, and I work uh, at uh, Red Hat, where I do some uh, data science things occasionally. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about uh, how we can better understand um, the quality um, of the benchmarks that we use for uh, large language models. Um, so, I don't know. How many of you, show of hands, have like either cr like directly used or did comparison shopping of models based on benchmarks, um, trying to compare models? Okay, a, f a few of you. Um, and you can see here's a few common ones on the left. Um, I don't know, actually have any of you used these ones in particular? Yeah, good. Um, so, of course, we use these, um, people use them to compete on things like leaderboards. So here's a little screenshot of the Open LLM leaderboard um, and just specifically sorting by MMLU. Um, and I'm going to be in this talk using MMLU as an example because I had to use something. Um, I want to stress that I'm not in any way trying to pick on MMLU or any one thing in particular. I just it's a good it's a good one to do examples. Um, it has about 115,000, you know, question and answer pairs. The answers are multiple choice, which actually makes it nice for scoring. It's a pretty unambiguous. Um, it covers just shy of 60, you know, basically academic um, subjects. So sometimes you might hear it referred to as like the SAT of the benchmarks. Um, and so in this talk, I'm going to be asking the question, um, who watches the Watchman, which is a question that goes all the way back to uh, you know, Roman playwright here, circa 100 AD, so a very long time. Um, and the question with regards to LLMs is, if popular benchmarks are a Watchman, how sure are we really that they're measuring what we need to know? Um, and so if you took a cynical view of that, I might say that I'm trying to inject some uh, FUD into this e uh, equation. Um, however, I don't actually want anybody to be afraid. Um, I just, you know, do admit that I think we should maybe be feeling a little bit of uncertainty. Um, and at this point, you're wondering, it's like, but Eric, why, why would you want this for us? Um, and I think, you know, Socrates had it right that <clears throat> um, it's just as important for us to understand, like, the things that we don't really know as it is to understand what we do know. Um, and uh, furthermore, I hope that by doing this, I can help all of us um, just to become better educated consumers of the models that we uh, are out there shopping for. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be discussing this quite a lot in terms of uh, coverage. Um, and for those of you who may not know what that means, if you have a space of possible objects, which could be almost anything, um, and you have a subset of those objects which you're actually examining, that's basically um, the concept of coverage. And you can see on the, on the left we have um, you know, a lower coverage set than on the right. But even, you know, even, even well-covered things can sometimes have areas of low coverage, I'm like the little area there on the right side. Um, you know, coverage can be applied to all kinds of domains. You can um, discuss coverage in terms of like doing science experiments and the measurements that you're taking, um, how well are they covering a space. Um, you can ask how well you're testing different kinds of uh, parameter settings and covering the total possible space of those. Um, you can ask if you're doing learning models, um, you, have, you can ask how well your training data covers the total possible space of inputs. Um, and of course, benchmarks um, also are testing you know, certain kinds of inputs. So you can ask how well does that cover? Um, and um, I'm going to be specifically focusing on these last two today with regards to uh, large language models. Um, and to do this, I'm, uh, for better or worse, going to be uh, doing a little bit of basic combinatorics. Um, for those of you who are not particularly interested in math, I'll try to make it as clear as possible. Um, so <clears throat> most of these arguments are going to be about the question, how many sequences can I make? Um, and so like, if I have a number of symbols, k, to build my sequences out of them a particular length, and the simple 
formula here is it's k to the power n possible sequences. And so like in this simple example here, um, if I have two symbols, which are possums and sloths, and I want a sequence length of three, then um, you know the total possible sequences is two to the third power or eight. And you can see those eight possible sequences down in the lower right. Um, but what, are, what, what kinds of k and n values might we see for large language models? And so for the most part, k for us is going to be like the vocabulary size. And um, I'm going to be using an example of like 100,000 words, which is relatively typical. You can see models that have smaller ones or larger ones. Um, n might depend a little bit on context. Like if I'm actually looking at the length of a single input, like a query, um, an example of that might be 20 a 20 token query. Um, but if I'm considering the entire possible context window as an input, um, that could be a lot larger. A common context window size might be 4,000. And of course, modern models, um, some of these are actually significantly larger than that. But we'll, we'll, we'll take these as our values. And so um, if I was going to ask how many total possible contexts there are for this model that it might actually see, then it's K is 100,000 and is 4,000, and so it's 100,000 to the power 4,000. Um, and it's worth discussing a little bit, I don't know, what kind of number that is. Um, I actually just used big int because I'm a JVM nerd and computed it, and you can see that um, at the end, if you run this, um, you very quickly get to 10 to the power 20,000, which you, if you're good at. If you could exponent math, you could actually have done that in your head. But um, I actually printed it out, and if you shrink the font down to microscopic size, you can actually put all that on a single terminal. Um, and there it is. Um, and it's it's like actually tricky to even like convey how large a number this is. But like I don't know, a common estimate of the number of atoms in the observable universe is 10 to the power 80. So if you took the number of atoms in the universe and then raised that to the 250th power, this is the number that you would actually get. Um, so it's, it's truly a stupendously large number. Um, now, of course, not all of those are inputs that we're likely to see in the real world. Like I could just type the word possum 4,000 times. That's one possible input. Um, or possum sloth, possum sloth, you know or any, literally any 4,000 randomly selected tokens from my vocabulary could be one of these inputs. Um, and of course, that's a much larger number than what I'm going to call structured inputs. Um, however, it's not actually totally irrelevant. If you look at like some of the published techniques for, um, <clears throat> you know, hack, hacking these models, one of them is literally just asking it to, uh, you know, repeat words over and over again. In this case, I think they're using the word poem. Um, Somebody should have tested possum over and over again. Um, so these these nonsense, this large space of nonsense inputs is not actually, you know, ignorable. We can't pretend like that can't happen out there. Um, but anyway, what, what are like structured inputs? The things we actually expect of our systems. Things like queries. Um, you know, like does my homeowner policy cover flood damage? Um, or in this other one, it's just sort of like a kind of a rag style uh, prompt that you generate for output. Um, so we could try to count like expected normal inputs. Um, and I did a bunch of, I don't know, Googling around trying to find good estimates. I think the, my favorite is uh, this blog post here where <clears throat> he's asking how, how you know, many English sentences are there on the order of like 20, 20 words. Um, and he, he comes up with an estimate of 10 to the power 22 sentences, which I wrote out there. Or if we like metrics, it's 10 zeta sentences. Um, however, I think his, his argument doesn't really take into account that, of course, not all word combinations are really equiprobable, like this sentence here, purple theorems dream noisily. Technically, I think he's counting sentences like that, and I'm not sure I want to. And so my counteroffer is to take his estimate and divide it by 1,000 to try and capture some of the sparsity. Um, so now, now we're down to a mere 10 exa sentences um, that are out there that might be <coughs> conveyed in the, in the English language. Um, so we can ask some questions like, 
how many sentences uh, might we see in a, how many sequences of sentences in a context window. And so again, if we assume, you know, 20, 20 word um, sentences and our context window is 4,000, we end up with basically K now is that number of sentences. So it's 10 to the power 19 to the power 200 or 10 to the power 3,800. Um, of course, not in real life, not all sentences follow each other. Um, like you could theoretically just <coughs> type all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy over and over again. Um, as we know from both film and literature, that's not sane. Um, so I don't know, again, to try to capture the sparsity, I'm gonna divide by 10 to the power 100, um, which is still pretty large, 10 to the power 3,700, you know, sequences of sentences. So like, you know, what number does that look like? Um, I don't have to shrink the font down quite as far, but it's still truly enormous. Again, if like the number of atoms in the universe to the power 46 is like what it takes to get to that number. So it's, even though it's much smaller than the other number, it's still like ridiculously large. Um, so now we can ask some coverage questions. Um, like what is the coverage of the MMLU benchmark? So again, it's about 115,000 questions. Um, <clears throat> and they're relatively short questions, so I'm gonna compare this to the number of English sentences. And so here we have 115,000 divided by 10 to the 19th. And you get this number, um, you know, 1.15 times 10 to the negative 14, which looks like that bunch of big zeros to the right of the decimal point. So it's really, frankly, a pretty good approximation of zero coverage. Um, and to, to picture how far it is from like being good coverage, even if you could expand it by a factor of a trillion, it would still be only like a 1% coverage of the possible space. Um, so we could also ask this of like training data sets. So like what's the coverage of uh, the common crawl training set? It's got about 630 billion tokens. Um, of course, we know that the training itself tends to work in like sort of sliding window fashion. So that's also going to be about the number of contexts you see during the training. Um, so I divide that number by the total number of context windows in this case, which is 10 to the power 3700. And I get this very, very small number. Um, and again, it's approximately 0% coverage. In fact, it's even more zero than the other one is. Um, if I could expand common crawl by a factor of a Google to the power 36, it would still be like one over a Google coverage of those possible contexts. So it's like, these are truly difficult spaces to cover. Um, and some of you, if you are into data science, might be asking, it's like, but Eric, what about, where are these estimates coming from? They're all pretty crude. Um, and you are correct. They're very crude estimates. Um, but Estimates are models, and as um, George Box said, you know they're all they're all wrong, but some of them are useful. And I claim to you that, like as crude as they are, they're good enough to make the arguments that I'm trying to make today. Um, so why is coverage a problem? Is it because data scientists are lazy? Um, obviously not. Are we bad at our jobs? I think most of us are not. We're good at our jobs. So what's the problem? The problem is that the spaces we're trying to cover are just enormously huge. Um, the, uh, you, you, you come for the data science, but you stay for the possum memes. Um, the, uh, so the other, the, other, the other concept I wanna talk a little bit about is robustness, and so like with a model, um, robustness is just the ability of the model to actually perform correctly on kinds of input it has not seen before, um, different variations. And of course, we, we saw this before LLMs. Um, you know, here's an example from object recognition. Um, and you can see that if you, if you add a little bit of noise to the image, um, suddenly it mis miscategorizes the image totally. It calls this pig an airplane. Um, and you can, See that, like you know, this is arguably a robustness problem, right? Because you and I can look at those images and not even notice that they're different at all. But tweaking tweaking the input just a little bit in a certain direction causes the neural net to fail completely. Um, so w w what is going on inside these nets? Um, <coughs> neural nets, and I'm not going to discuss why this is, but neural nets basically break a space up into a bunch of 
n-dimensional planes. And so in two dimensions, it might actually look kind of like this. This is the neural net's view of the world. And this, this one possum at the bottom got misclassified because it landed in the wrong subspace. Um, and so essentially it's like saying, when the neural net was training, it drew that, it drew that edge in the wrong, the wrong area. Um, so we have a slight robustness problem here. Um, we, we can study the same thing, not just in images, of course, but with large language models. Um, so here I asked a uh, large language model <coughs> three, three versions of basically the same question, which is like how many, how many valence electrons does the atom of Einsteinium have? Um, and the first one might be correct if you construe valence as like oxidation state, but the other two are completely wrong. And the bigger point is that asking the question in all these different ways gave totally different answers. So, you know, I would claim that this is sort of like a, an indication of like robustness issues with large language models. Um, coverage and robustness are tightly correlated. Um, regions of low coverage typically correspond to, you know, um, lower inference robustness. Um, if you don't train in a certain space, it's less likely you do its job right. Um, an example of this is if I ask those same questions um, about more common elements like carbon or iron, it was much more likely to get the answers right because it's seen more stuff written about carbon and iron than it has Einsteinium, as you might guess. Um, so anyway, testing robustness also requires good coverage because like, if you don't test a lot of things, you don't know how robust your model might actually be. Um, robustness is not easy or cheap to measure um, because like I said, in order to do it well, you actually have to really try to cover the whole space and figure out like where it's getting it wrong. Um, otherwise, are you really sure? Um, and of course, this, this is really a pretty simplified version. Um, you know, the size of the nets we use, you know, break up the regions into many, many regions. Um, and in fact, it's probably worse. It probably looks more like that. Um, so let's talk a little bit about subjects um, coverage. Here's the actual list of subjects uh, from the MMLU. Um, you can see, as I mentioned, they're all basically academic kinds of subjects. Um, and we might ask, if we're doing real work, um, you know, like what, what does this all say about my company's insurance chatbot? Um, it's a pretty good question, right? So, um, and it's not irrelevant because like every time people release these benchmarks, the time from benchmark release to like the community starting to actually use it on their training data is down to about three weeks. Um, like one of my old mentors said, you have to uh, be careful about what it is you're actually incentivizing because you're going to get it. <laughs> um, and uh, this guy Colin Cunningham said it even better. It's like, you know, be even more careful what you work for because you're going to get it even faster. Um, <clears throat> so, like, what do insurance queries look like? These are all questions. I think I've asked my insurance carrier one time or another in my life. Um, and. I, I use these, I wanted to actually, oh, we'll see, they're just gonna come back later. But um, I wanted to ask like what they look like in embedding space. Um, how many of you have like used a vector database or other embedding space application? Quite a few. Um, in case people who don't, you know, the idea of an embedding space is that, um, you know, it takes objects like these objects on the left and puts them into a space that has some semantic meaning. Um, so then this, like, we might hope that a possum and a sloth are close together because they're both mammals. Um, a bug is farther away because it's not a mammal, and a rock is not any kind of animal at all. So, um, you know, and you can train. There's a lot of work that goes into training these models to do this embedding well. Um, so I, d I did this. Um, I took, in this, in this plot, I took what's called the MMLU dev set, which is like 285 of these questions. I actually also generated a little bit of synthetic data to help flush the space out, and I added the insurance questions. And so I, I ran a dimensionality reduction from 2,500 down to two dimensions and to see what it looks like. And you can see a couple things here. Um, the first is that uh, the MMLU is not really covering the space altogether. There's some significant regions where it's not. And um, the insurance questions get mapped, like kind of like off to the side. 
Um, and so, you know, it's sort of a, it's like a visual way of saying what we probably already can suspect, which is that, you know, if I'm looking at MMLU, but I'm, my, my company's doing insurance, it's maybe not telling me everything I need to know about, like, how it's going to do on the queries that I ask it. Um, now, this method is not perfect because mapping 2,500 dimensions down to two comes with problems. Um, here, I did the same thing, except I used the test cell, which is larger, it's 15,000 points. You can see that the picture gets a lot murkier. Um, and if you look closely, though, you can see that actually the insurance questions are kind of like landing in a region that isn't actually really covered by the data. Um, but you can see it's not a, you know, <coughs> The, the task of mapping things down to visible dimensions is fraught with potential problems, but I do claim that this is suggestive. Um, so there are questions. Um, like, I used an actual large language model to extract these embeddings. There are literally embedding models, like the kind used for vector databases. So if I'd used those, would the picture be more informative? Um, you know, should I, should I use like a different methodology for computing the embeddings? I used a particular way that was probably about the simplest thing to get working. You could get fancier. Um, as I mentioned before, is trying to do this kind of dimensionality reduction just a losing game for testing these theories? I'm not sure yet. Um, is there a better method out there somebody could think of? Um, what would other benchmarks besides MML look like? So like, or am I just completely wrong? Um, I haven't proven that I'm wrong. Yeah. Uh, so going back to coverage, where, where does this leave us like in the world of real applications? Um, I'm, you know, on some level you're on your own. It means you need to construct your own benchmarks. Um, and it's again, not easy to do because there's always like multiple ways to ask a question and multiple ways to answer it. I would claim that like, you know, those first three questions are, could all be different ways of asking about the same problem and those ones on the bottom here that frankly I could construe any of those as a correct answer. Um, and so again this trying to cover all these possibilities ups your cost. Um, and I want, I want to like you know be clear that like answers to questions like these insurance questions are very very context dependent. It depends on who I am what policy I've got, like who my insurance provider is. And so like, you know, it's not even like I would expect the community to have insurance question benchmarks because I don't think you could make them. Um, the only, only the application engineer can like produce these. Um, so the good, the good news is, of course, we're, we're not helpless. Um, there are good open source tools. Um, for helping to address these. Uh, Argea is a great customizable platform. It allows you to produce little forms to collect feedback from your users um, and figure out when it's getting stuff wrong. And you can use the, you can use the answers that the people give to improve your training sets. Um, and uh, PromptFoo is great because it allows you sort of set up environment for the tracking the performance of your internal applications uh, against the data sets that you collect and do sort of like, you know, almost continuous testing. Um, there, there are other tools too. These are ones that my team has specifically used well. Um, so I've been obviously talking a lot about sort of like accuracy metrics. There are many other types of metrics. Um, here's a list of them all from like, you know, giving the wrong answer to causing actual property damage or <laughs> giving bad medical advice, right? All these things are, people are producing benchmarks for all of these as well. Um, and the main, the main message here is that every one of these is gonna have the same issues of coverage as um, accuracy does. Um, and so, well, there are some things we might try to do. Um, if we tried to understand the way our models are breaking up the actual input space, um, it might allow us to be smarter. We could like focus our data on just the edges. Um, so it's like reduce the cost of figuring out like what the problems are. Um, again, as I mentioned before, I used some pretty crude estimates today. Um, and while I think they are good to make my argument, it would be extremely interesting to actually um, study and get better more precise estimates of some of these um, numbers. Um, and of course, as I mentioned before, people are always trying to make embeddings better and better embeddings reduce all of these problems, which is good. Um, and I think 
another thing that you're seeing a trend towards, which is also fantastic, is that um, people are getting smarter and more strategic about the role uh, the LMs play in these larger systems. Um, a great example is this new popularity of graph rag. Um, and what you see here is, you know, LLMs themselves, by themselves, are frankly not very good at knowing things. And for better or worse, knowing things is mostly what we're trying to ask these systems to do. And so a system like GraphRag um, is great because what it does is it extracts most of the knowledge, the knowing stuff, out into, you know, a, a database. Oftentimes it's a graph database, but it doesn't have to be. And it bypasses the actual LLM part as much as possible so that there's less possibility of hallucination. Um, uh, the previous talk had a great technique where they normalized the training data and so like they actually reduced hallucination that way. That's actually a way of reducing the size of the space you're trying to cover. Um, so I thought that was actually quite, quite cool. Um, so if you want to learn more about this, um, two of my teammates, uh, Sari and Hema, um, earlier in the week, um, already gave a great talk on how to build trust with LLMs. Um, if you didn't catch this talk, you can get the recording, hopefully, um, when they publish the recordings. Um, Surya also has a blog post about uh, ways we measure the accuracy of models and some of the benchmarks that are used, so it's a great way to like learn more about uh, those topics. Um, and <coughs> the actual notebook that I used to generate these plots I was talking about earlier is also up on GitHub, so you can use it, so you can poke holes in it, you can figure out better ways to do what I was trying to do if you want to, or just see what it was I was actually doing. Um, and of course there are a bunch of open communities now, the AI Alliance and ML Commons are two big ones that both have, um, you know, focus areas and working groups in the space of AI trust and safety, so um, many people are trying to get better um, at how we do how do all these things. Um, so what can you do? Um, I hope I hope that uh, you know you can use this knowledge to become more educated consumers of not both the models and the benchmarks that we use to run them or evaluate them. Um, you can try to hopefully like use these tools to increase the coverage of your own customized benchmarks um, and you know use your voice like advocate to the community that like, we must do better if we can. Um, and of course we can, using research um, to try to expand the frontier of how, how we can get better at all these things. Um, so at the end of it, um, who, who, who does watch The Watchmen? And I, I would say that um, we all watch each other. And not, not in a weird, creepy way, but like in a scientific method way, where we're all trying to like, you know, help each other to do you know, better um, and expand, expand human's knowledge. Um, and that is my talk. Uh, thanks, everybody. First question is, um, I saw you do some uh, dimensionality reduction uh, using T, S, and E, right? Yes. Have you ever tried to use some other dimensionality reduction algorithm instead of, uh, um, besides T, S, and E, and compare the... I, I actually did. Um, and in fact, I on some level, I worked my way through all of the uh, methods in the uh, SKLearn <laughs> manifold library. Uh -huh. um, I felt that I felt that T SNE like captured what I was trying to capture the best, and I truly to this day I'm not sure if that means I was cheating or not. It certainly wasn't cheating in the sense that like I gave it the data and T SNE unsupervised produced you know that image. Um, but also it is true that I sort of like tried a bunch of methodologies and picked the one that like back to my story of the best. So. <laughs> yeah, okay, I see. Um, yeah, I also do the similar experiment before. I found that different uh, algorithms is actually good at the different uh, uh, perspective uh, of the, it de depends on the embedding, depends on the, the data, the original dimensions, uh, but uh, it's not like uh, one just kind of outperform, outperform all the other 
in all kind of aspects. No, it's not right. It's just a kind of a, yeah, it's, I, I, think, I think I forgot the, the summary, but uh, it's kind of a, in some aspect, one is better than the other, yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks. In that case, thank you very right. much. I appreciate it. Thanks, everybody.